Those who know who I am, my name is Darren Kuhn. I'm from Teacher Geek. Uh, from those who don't, I guess, I'm still from Teacher Geek. My name is Darren. I, uh, I came all the way from Rochester, New York, and my flight arrived at 3 in the morning this morning. So, <laughs> so I'm a little sleep deprived. I found out how far you guys are away from, uh, from Salt Lake. And uh, what I did, I came to, uh, to try to, uh, to send you guys on a bit of an innovation adventure. Um, I am giving a, a talk to kind of close things out tomorrow, and I'll talk a little bit more about who I am and as far as that kind of stuff, uh, why I started Teacher Geek then. Um, today, I kind of want to focus on uh, getting your hands dirty, getting into it. All right, um, to start, let me just turn this thing off. I come from a family of technology teachers. My dad, my brothers, we're all technology teachers. So when I started teaching, I, uh, I started aside my father. And he had these ridiculously cool competitions where the, the kids are competing with vehicles, they're going up hills, they're going, and so I started doing it. But there was a major, major problem. It was really difficult to create the mechanisms that were needed. It was expensive. Um, it, once they created something, they ended up having to like hot glue it together and it just wouldn't work. So that kind of gave way, it led to Teacher Geek. Um, I do industrial engineering, I do all kinds of, you'll see, in fact, you know some of my products that are in the stores. Um, but uh, what I did, I wanted to come up with a system. It started out quite simple, where if you have two gears, and you put them onto a dowel, you can just slide these things on, they turn together. So there wasn't any hot glue, but more importantly, if you didn't want that gear, if you wanted to change it for another one, you just slid that one off and you slid another one on. So that was the whole premise behind the system. You see, oops, this should look uh, familiar to you, right? The design, everyone has different iterations of it, but this is, whoops, not that. The problem solving process. It's used in design, engineering. I mean, you guys, you know this? I mean, you must teach it, all right. Well, here's the ridiculous problem that I had in my class. The kids would go one time around this circle and they would stop because they couldn't really change it. I mean, this stuff is meant to be combined with wood and whatever you've got, metal, um, recycled stuff in your classroom. Um, but the problem was, um, once they would get around, whether it be hot gluing, bri or not hot gluing, gluing bridges together, um, creating these vehicles, it was very, very difficult for them to continue to go around. There was another problem. Let's see if this looks familiar to you at all. Bloom's taxonomy? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been updated recently, but this is the foundation for our, our, our teaching practices. We know that we have to, well, in fact, we don't. See, often we'll throw kids in saying, all right, we want the kids to create something. But what we forget is that they need to actually work their way up. They have to start at the lowest cognitive level, and they've got to get all the way to the top. I mean, you can't skip a step. So, for example, for... Uh, for gears. The kids actually, they have to understand this is a gear, by definition. And then what does it do and how does it interact? From there, they can start putting these things together. And this is so incredibly important. They need to be able to experiment with these things. I love the idea of kids drawing stuff up in computer labs, but the problem is it often comes, I mean, they don't even know what they're drawing yet. They don't understand the, the, the fundamental concepts. You've got them, I just mentioned a vehicle, right? You've got them designing a transmission. So what I wanted to do is, well, first of all, create something that you can use in a computer lab if you, you have it, but allow them to, to actually play around and change. You're about to come up here in a few seconds and, uh, and you're gonna get some supplies. We have these kits with whole plates, gears, wheels, there's a bunch of stuff, and it'll allow you to do a number of different projects. I also want you to pick up a couple of other supplies. These are connector strips. Now these connector strips can be cut. Everything here is really, really inexpensive. 
So you cut the stuff up. Now, you just push the dowels into the hole. And you'll notice that these holes have a spline pattern. They have teeth. And they want to stick into the dowels. So they don't want to turn and they don't want to come out. But what if you want it to rotate? What if you want oh, a vehicle like this, right? To create something like this, I mean, we need some places where those dowels stick and stay. It's a press fit. We want other places where these dowels are free to rotate. It's called a free running fit. So in order to change that, we needed this right here, reamer. Now I don't have enough tools for everyone, so essentially I'm going to try to spread them out on the table, like every third person or something like that. We're going to have to share these things. So it's this simple. If you want a dowel to rotate, you take the reamer and you put it through the hole. And now the dowel spins freely. Right. So it's really simple. I mean, there's, there's nothing brilliant about this. I want to get you into it. So I'm not going to waste any more time. I just want to tell you what I want you to pick up. Some of these components that you're going to see up here are for us in the future, not this like, current little problem solving process I'm going to have you doing. So in these boxes, I want you to pick up one of these. Um, I'll try to kind of scatter the tools around. I want you to pick up these sheets here, um, a quick start guide. This quick start guide is only really one page. Um, and then this gets into something that we're going to be doing later on, which is your, uh, your wind pump. So let's get to it. Uh, if you guys can come on up here, grab one of these, one of those. Oh, I almost forgot. And, and one made in Rochester, New York. We have gigantic injection molding presses. We have, oh my gosh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in injection molds to make these things, to pump these parts out. And we do it so fast. I mean, hundreds of thousands of parts at a time. Um, we're able to get these prices incredibly, incredibly low because I know it won't work if we can't. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with the bug? <laughs> Tom, I know, introduced it. What, when did you introduce it here? We, we did two summers ago. Two summers ago? Yeah, All right. This is the fastest growing electro, uh, electronics activity in, it could be in the world. It's definitely in the United States. I taught middle school and I taught high school. Electronics was about, well, let's get through this boring stuff, you know, Ohm's law, what it resists, and blah, 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 blah. And then we'll get into a project. And it was really, really difficult when we got into that project to actually tie it to that content knowledge that they had earlier. And the other teachers that I was teaching with were having them put these higher end components, resistors, capacitors, transistors on. The kids had no clue. It was, they might as well have been putting beads on a string. They had no clue what they were doing. They were just occupying their time. So um, I, I came up with the idea, the concept of the bug. And uh, let's see if the bug like, yeah. The bug, if you are not familiar with it, is built as a body. You have the switches, you have the motors, but you don't have the wiring. And they actually go through, and with alligator clips, they go through this lab, the labs, and they wire this thing up. Now as a teacher, I knew that I had a good thing for a number of reasons. One, the kids weren't like tugging on me, like, Mr. Kuhn, Mr. Kuhn, like, how do I, what do I, blah, blah, blah. I actually was able to, as the kids were working on this, they were so engaged, so focused, I was able to actually do what I was supposed to be doing, teaching, you know, facilitating this whole process. Um, and then I had uh, a group, the first time I did this, I had uh, a group of girls who the first time they got their bug to move, this is actually a remote control bug there, I usually have them steer it through a course, like, and if they go outside of it, um, then they've got to start over and it's a whole competition. Um, these girls um, could, not, could not control themselves. They were jumping up and down. Those girls went on to our high school pre-engineering courses and are now graduates of the Rochester Institute of Technology. And those were the first success stories that came out of TeacherGeek. Um, when we implemented the bug in our middle school, our electronics enrollment in the high school tripled. 
Um, some of you might have heard me talking um, about pricing earlier when we were up here. I started Teacher Geek to make a difference. I have considered the whole nonprofit aspect, but it causes some, some complexities business wise. It is, in essence, a non for profit company. Um, I support my family with my other ventures, my other companies. Teacher Geek has never paid me a cent. I put hundreds of thousands of dollars into it, um, and it's growing incredibly fast. So um, I can only imagine we're going to be able to bring the prices down even lower as uh, economy of scale provides. All right, so this bug allows them to go through, and they learn what they need to, the fundamental aspects of electricity. I designed this for middle school. And I have universities, well-known universities, ordering this because the professors are saying, by the time the students get there, they, 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 they don't know what they're doing. They, they missed the fundamentals. All right, so that's that. Now let's get on to uh, that, uh, those parts that you have in front of you. The uh, quick start guide. I apologize. My computer, I had this uh, presentation ready to go, and it wasn't going to, it didn't want to run for me here, so. Um, if you can open up that guide, in fact, I'm not even going to worry about the computer. I'm going to grab a lab just like you guys have. All right, what I want you to do is actually try to create this example mechanism. What I want you to do is I want you to take a connector strip and I want you to cut that thing in half, just like this. Snap it in half. I mean, you can try to get it between the two holes, but you don't have to, all right? I wasn't right on center, so maybe I'll trim it back up again. All right, now I'm going to grab a dowel. Of course, in a classroom, there'd be uh, usually measuring involved. And I'm going to snip this twice. Now these dowels I grabbed from, I didn't grab, um, the guys in the warehouse grabbed them from, um, from a region which is kind of moist, so they're a little bit big. Now I just push it, if you kind of wiggle them in, you can get them, you'll see how they, I just made a frame. And this thing is robust. So it's going to hold together, it's going to stay together, but if I want to change it, I just pull it apart. All right, and the next thing that you want to do is uh, you're going to grab a reamer and you're going to ream two holes that are in line with each other. The, you'll see the reamer's extremely safe. All right, so we put these things together. I've got that free running fit that I was just talking to you guys about. All right, now this is where it really gets cool. I want you to try, just grab two gears. Do you have different color gears in your kit? Yes, you do, good. Grab two gears and throw those things on. All right, that's my first gear, it spins. Of course, it comes out still, we'll dress that in a second. All right, now I've got to figure out where that second gear is going to go. You guys are going to keep up with me. I understand that. And plus, you're sharing tools. So I'm just going to uh, go over this and kind of leave you then to, uh, to experiment. All right, this is where it really gets cool. We now have two gears that will turn together. Do we want a transmission? I could actually, if I had this connector strip longer, I could go over to the other side and I could put gears here. I could continue to gear up, gear down, you know, whatever you're looking to do. But how do you keep these things from falling out? You have two different parts in your kit that are going to keep these dowels in place. The first component is what we started with a long time ago. It's a custom vinyl extrusion. We call it slide stop. You just cut a section off, you know, say like a quarter inch, and you slide it on. I'm actually going to cut these dowels 
so I don't want them that long. Really? Yeah. Here, I've got one here. The metal spins in the handle. Huh. I haven't seen that before. All right, now this is the second component right here. This is a stop clip. Now this stop clip hooks around like a, a C. What you want to do with a stop clip, and it'll actually show you in your instructions, you're going to slide it on and then snap it with your fingers. When it snaps on, there's a rib in the inside that grooves the dowel. This is the, the stop clip is the best way, if you need something really secure, to secure it. Now we have two components that are going to spin together. You've got a wheel in your kit. If you want to throw that wheel on to the other side, you can. Your first mechanism. Hydraulic arms. You guys use syringes, it's pretty popular to create this kind of stuff. Um, we just went one step further. We created these mounts for the syringes with these pins. So the syringes, we call them cylinders. <laughs> so these cylinders can be mounted and interconnected with the rest of the components. And uh, that allows you to, to build what you need to. All right, while you're working, back to Bloom's taxonomy. I am 110% about innovation. Um, tomorrow you'll actually hear me talk. The companies that I work with, there is now a deficit of in engineers um, that have the capacity to, to truly innovate. Um, it will, there's, uh, there's some horrible paradigms that beginning to establish themselves where we actually have companies, at least around Rochester, New York, looking to over um, non-US born engineers because of um, capacities for certain reasons to innovate beyond gen the, the general or generic um, engineers of, of, uh, of the United States. So it's very, very important for, uh, for me that we, we actually facilitate the process, that we, we allow the kids to become innovators earlier on. When I was in college, I worked with a neuroscientist. And uh, with a functional MRI, we actually graphed the brain. And you could see regions of the brain light up for creative processes. We saw later on when uh, people didn't utilize, when they didn't develop these processes um, when they were young, how difficult, almost impossible it was for them to, to, to actually grow these, develop these regions later on. So when I started teaching, I tried to get the kids right into creating, not really understanding the learning process. I tried to throw them right into it. All right, that's it. Design a transmission. We're not going to build it yet because we don't, we don't have it designed. And, uh, and, and the kids had incredible difficulty. So what I learned is the kids actually have to, you know, you tell them this is a gear, this is how they work. And then as far as applying, the most fundamental step that I was missing was experimentation. Just like you guys are doing right now, it's fundamentally necessary for the kids to experiment on their own. It's one thing for them to assemble the mechanism just like you have here. It's far more important for them to tweak it and change it and learn from the resultant. That allows them to grow their cognitive level into analysis and evaluation and before you know it they're able to create their own things. Every teacher geek, not every teacher geek product, but most teacher geek products come with an example build. And in the beginning I tried to keep people away from those, you know, like if you just need it, use it. But then what I realized is 
the example build is actually the experimentation for the kids. This is often where they learn about this. And the neat thing about these parts, they can evolve their example. It's not as though they build the example and then it's fixed. They can't change it. They can build the example, learn what they need to, and then start to tweak and evolve it. They can do the experimentation before the example, during the example, um, and then start to create their own innovative solution after that. When the bugs are finished, every single bug has its own personality because the way that the kids create it, I mean, they're inherently different. The way that they bend the, the wings, the way that they um, create the tires, the feelers. So they, some of them are like a spas. You know, they have these knee-jerk reactions. Some of them, they all wander in different ways. You would literally, you would, you would believe that there was some sort of a brain controlling these things. Um, many people, when they look, I don't know if you, it's a little hard for me to show you here, but um, bugs, when they bump into something, whoop, they, they turn and they, they go the other direction. They create their own magnet configurations. Now, I don't know what capacities you have in your school, but if you've got an oscilloscope or something like that, I mean, you can snap a single magnet into here and watch it go around and actually see how and why the current is produced. You can wrap your stators differently. These stators are free floating. So, here I have, you see the gears? We have now a little more elaborate mechanism. Now, I wanted you guys, when you started out, to put the gears on the outside because it's a little easier to do. Gears actually run a little more efficiently when they're on the inside of your frame. Now, some of you I see are starting to assemble the whole plate, which is great. Um, and uh, the beginning of what will be your wind pump. Um, this is a similar transmission to your wind pump um, using a few more gears, which you can do if you want. Um, and all right, so I was going to tell you guys, if you wanted the kids to experiment with different stator configurations, watch this. They just take it off. They can put a different one on. So for those of you who are familiar with wind, I mean, delta, star, you know, three phase. I mean, there's an endless combination of these things. And it's powerful enough where they can actually, you can rectify this and drive a DC motor. We have uh, a video online, you'll actually see a car driving up a hill powered by the wind turbine. Now this right here is just uh, the end of a flashlight. It shows you a few LEDs and we can drive hundreds of LEDs off of this thing. But um, see I crank it up how it's a tremendous amount of current. I don't have a meter here. Um, now, you guys know that uh, power output isn't just voltage, right? It's current over voltage, right? So, um, yeah, you could get, if we're talking voltage, I mean, I, you could essentially wrap this thing with really fine wire. You could produce whatever, a few hundred volts probably, but it would be uh, a worthless amount of current. Um, what I find is... <laughs> 
Do you teach electricity? <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. All right, we'll go for voltage first. All right. Yeah, can you give me a hand? Here, I'll let you crank it if you want. You can hold them. You got it? Yep. Keep going, just crank it way up. Okay, without, with the load, we're looking at uh, about two and a half top. But if I take the load off, we'll see it skyrocket. Here we go. Oops, hold on. What we should be seeing out of this generally, we'll see somewhere around. Connection. Three, five, six. Six, seven. Yeah, we should see it, which is probably pretty appropriate. It depends on your meter and how it interprets the, the phase. But um, we should see somewhere around, with that winding right there, around, around 9 volts. Um, that winding there is configured um, with a current priority. It's made to power um, motors, LEDs that, that run about like that, uh, that voltage. Thank you. But we have other turbines coming out too. You're going to find a mini hub that's going to be coming. I, in fact, you guys have, no one else knows about this. <laughs> there is a, a mini, a tiny little hub that's going to be coming out. And that hub can be used for a number of different things. If you do anything with propellers, the kids can actually create their own propellers. Because it's pretty lame often in school uh, when you have to give the kids a propeller that's already then, I mean, they, they don't know anything about it. They simply put it onto their motor and, and it starts up and whatever, you know, whatever they're going to be doing with their project. With this, they can actually create their own propeller um, in a smaller fashion to this. They can also use that as um, a mini turbine, which will generate, which will drive a motor. And there's also a mini alternator that's coming out, which is smaller than this one. And it's just at a lower price level. How are we coming? It looks like everyone is kind of heading into the, the build for your, um, your wind pump. So I'll, I'll start on to that. Now I have to tell you, you're going to need some more components. On this table here, I have those additional components you're going to need. That fender washer, the locking nut. Um, there are pliers, if you want to kind of, if you don't have pliers, no one has pliers now, but if you uh, want to grab some pliers and bring them back to, to your area if you don't have them, that will allow you to, oh, and um, screwdrivers, to turn on the locking washer. You're going to need, I don't know if you're going to need this or not, I don't know what they put in your kit, you might need another one inch bolt too. So essentially, of these parts here, the hardware, if you want to take one of each, that allow you to complete that build, your wind pump build. And you can also buy, there's a mount, which just is a straight shank, and then you can build the rest of it. The mount is a lot less expensive. But this is how it works. If I turn this thing sideways, you have these brackets, and your pump just slides in between. There are pins in this bracket, so we're now secure. So a kid walks up with their project, throws it on here, tests it, is off to revise, uh, you know, do something else. Another kid is able to then come up, put their project on, and test it. So swapping out projects is a matter of, I don't know, 10 seconds or something like that. And it's robust. So 
you buy the you buy the bug as a kid. What is it? Two dollars? Did you say? Uh, six. Six picture. Punched them, but then the green and the yellow. Didn't <laughs> yeah. Match, and so I had to try and figure it out. <laughs> see, there you go. But I see it. If in the picture, it's too clear. Excellent job. So this is this is what it does. Now this is a single action pump. You could throw another with uh, another gear. You could put another cylinder on here. You could actually make a dual action pump if you wanted to. There are tons of different configurations of this thing. Now, your turbine, you're going to want to optimize this thing. The gears that you have in now are likely not the perfect gears for whatever the blade configuration is that you end up coming up with later. You could actually use the remainder of the gears that you have in your set and increase the mechanical advantage. What does that mean? It means that it's going to be less, you're going to need more RPMs, so your, your turbine should turn faster, right? But um, the cylinder itself is not going to be pumping as, as uh, because of the mechanical advantage, it's not going to be pumping as fast per revolution of, of your blade. So you, you're going to have to experiment. You want to change your blade configuration, your pitch. You want to experiment with your gearing. Um, you also want to experiment with the positioning of your cylinder here because you're going to want, well, you don't, maybe, maybe you don't want the greatest amount of throw, the greatest amount of travel of, of your piston. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of development that goes into this after you're finished. What you have here is just your example. It is not your optimal solution. All right, so we hook up Joe's. And uh, to start things off, I'm just going to cut a section of tubing. All right, we won't hook this thing up to the fan yet. All I'm going to do is, uh, Joe, could you, could you pump that thing? Absolutely. All right, I'm going to hold this thing up so you guys I'm going to hold this thing up, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to hold this thing up so you can see. All right, start pumping. Yeah, that's not what we want. <laughs> there's, there's some stuff coming now. All right, so what's going on here? All we're doing is what? We're pushing it in and out. We need a better solution. This is not going to work. We need a one-way valve. We need a check valve. <laughs> yeah, some of you might have seen these things. Over, what time does this session run to? Ten forty. All right, we don't have a lot of time. Over on the table here, we have T's, T connectors, and we have some check valves. Now I don't have enough of these for for everyone. Now, when you're doing this experiment, you're going to need check valves. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. When you have this, since you have this stuff in your classroom, if we have time, I'm going to also show you how to make, um, show the kids as far as um, how a jack works, mechanical advantage, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put check valves. Actually, use this. We put this thing up. We're going to put check valves so they're configured. This is All right, if this is your cylinder right here, this is the line that we had coming off of it now. So when the piston went up and down, it simply pushed and pulled the fluid. This was not the solution that we needed. So what we're going to do, we're going to come off of this to a T connector. We'll use a little bit of tubing. Now that T connector is going to go to some check valves. Well, for those of you who don't know how a check valve works, very, very simple. There are different types of check valves. Some check valves have a ball in them. Some of them have a flap. The check valve that we're using here has a flap. So water can enter. When the water enters, the check valve will move forwards and allow the water to continue through. But if water tries to flow back the other way, 
the flap closes and it stops that flow. So we're going to need two check valves for this. The first check valve I'll put right here. The second check valve I'll put right here. Now let's see how this is going to work. We'll have tubing coming in, tubing coming out, and those are our flaps. We're going to draw water. This is going to be our reservoir right here, back here. So we're going to draw water from here. The water is going to suck in through this first check valve. The check valve is going to open up, and the water is going to come down and it's going to fill this chamber. That's when that cylinder is drawn back. Then that cylinder is going to push. This piston is going to move in uh, a reciprocal movement. It's now going to try to push up. Will the water be able to get back through that check valve? That check valve is going to shut off and this check valve here is going to open up and the material is going to go this way. The water is going to go that way. <laughs> this is what it looks like. Two check valves and a T. So I'll cut a little bit more tubing here. Now, I would suggest that you don't give these check valves to all of your students. One, they're expensive and uh, they can add another third to the price of the project. But two, the check valves actually keep the water in the system. And the last thing you want are kids leaving this project with a cylinder full of water. So if you just leave the check valves at the test station, they can pull this on and off of their cylinder and it, actually, it works really, really well. All right. Can I crank it? Yeah, yeah, give it a crank. <laughs> okay, water is being sucked up and we're pumping it. Uh, what is work? <laughs> All right. So work is, is what? Okay, how easy would it be for us to measure? We're taking a volume of water, right? Which has a mass. And we're, we're moving at a distance. How, how easy would it be to calculate work? Can't get any easier. <laughs> What's that? Drilling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now other challenges. You, you don't want to make it easy for these guys. Switch up the competitions. So you have them create a pump. You can play around with that if you want. Just to, um, put a, if you want, put, a, um, put some blades onto it. <laughs> um, actually change the competition so that the, the turbine will face greater loading by putting the, where you're pumping the water to up higher. If you're pumping the water from the similar level, then there's a limited load on your turbine. So the blade should, you'll see them turn faster. But as soon as you pick up that water, you can actually hear and see the turbine bog down as it has to raise that volume of water a greater degree. The same thing happens with your turbines with an alternator on them. They'll spin nice and fast, and then you connect your load to it, whether it be a motor or, uh, or lights. And you'll, you'll hear the turbine go, rrr, rrr, and it'll bog down because it now takes greater torque in order to, uh, to, to power that load. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, I got a little blue spill though. Yeah.
right down the front of that cabinet. Yeah. Oh, do you need more? No, this will be fine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we, we're obviously starting to, to run short on time, so we won't have uh, opportunity for you to, to build your own blades, but I'll, I'll talk about that really quick. All right, there we go. We are cranking. We're pumping water. Do you see that is n not optimized yet? <laughs> you see how? <laughs> it was too close. I was going to hit this, so I had it on the very tip of the shaft. I oh, okay. Shaft Here, let's just trim that one down. <laughs> you can trim this one if you want. Oh, it's actually hitting this part right here. The oh, okay. The corner of that. Oh, um, we can change the pitch. Yeah. Change that easily. All right. It looks like probably when you guys get this document next time, the um, shaft leading out to the hub will be a bit, bit longer. You actually, you are, thank you very much. You are the first, you're like the, the guinea pigs, essentially. You're the first group to run through this, so I appreciate this. We're learning a lot. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right, quickly, before you guys have to get out of here, blades. We don't give you any kind of material for blades because we want it to be found, you know, recycled, all that kind of thing. Yes? Um, have your kids at, at um, election time. <laughs> After the election, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. The election signs. Recognize this? <laughs> I'll tell you how this came to be. Um, in in the wood shop, we changed from uh, vacuum systems. We changed to a cyclonic vacuum system, and the PVC pipe was replaced with, uh, with galvanized. This is a type of a turbine blade where um, if you go online, you'll see people um, will create extremely large versions of this um, where we're able to actually get our, um, our foil design or what works you know, under some of the Bernoullis uh, and uh, in vector theories out of, uh, by cutting a, a PVC pipe. What do you think the biggest factor is when you're designing turbine blades? Is it really the perfect shape? It's angle and surface area. We've done tons of research. Um, you guys must be, you're familiar with Kid Wind too, right? Some of you guys? We'll actually be working with Kid, Kid Wind and I, are, uh, and Teacher Geek are going to be teaming up in the future. Um, but uh, Kid Wind studies, our studies, have found that it, the, you know, you would think that you want the kids to create the perfect foil design and so forth. At this scale, when they're being powered by, the, you know, a, a fan like this, what it really comes down to, it's surface area, shape. Um, you're going to want to, like I was talking about, it's optimizing it for, uh, for your system here. Can anyone think with rubber bands how they could balance out the cylinder here so that when you're not actually pushing water, potentially, you could be stretching a rubber band and storing potential? There's so many different things you can do with this. Now, before you guys go, last, uh, I guess, last technical comment, you have some wheels in your kit. In your classroom, if you guys use this, you can choose to, it's inexpensive enough generally where you can have the kids take it home. It's about inspiring the kids. There's no better way to inspire than to provide a sense of success and accomplishment. There's no better way. So that's why I love these challenges uh, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing here. Um, so if kids want to take this home, that's what I want to allow, but some kids will not. Some kids will say, no, you keep it. And in that case, you can pull this stuff apart 
you can put it into a recycling bin, even the extra components. And it's like this creativity center for, for the kid. They can, it, it's, it's difficult for a kid to look at a full dowel and figure out a mechanism. But partial scraps and stuff that's easy for them to tune and you know just to play around with uh, to put whatever they have together. So that really brings the cost down in this year after year. You start to build up this reserve, um, and uh, and then you just find yourself buying less and less parts. Um, but in your kit, you have wheels, extra wheels. You can take the parts that you have for this wind pump. You could change this into a rubber band powered vehicle. Um, the week following on Teacher Geek, you'll actually find. We have a new unit. You, you guys are familiar with the mousetrap cars and that kind of stuff. This thing is so much better than the mousetrap cars. We're, I mean, it can go from second grade all the way up to university level with what the kids can do with gears, levers, and, and it's very, very inexpensive. Um, but you have some of the parts where if you want to, you can change that. And they're not snapping their fingers with mousetraps. <laughs> all right, so um, the day that one of my students hot glued their I, the, um, another student's eye shut was the day, it was the day I actually decided to, 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 ta to, to tackle this problem. Uh, he was, there was a kid that was building a bridge, and he, you know when you're driving, you do one of these? He looked closer, he did one of these. Another kid should have had safety glasses on, they did not, and they literally, um, they, they closed their eyes shut. So um, two years later, we had, we had the teacher geek system developed. And, um, and the nurse loved us. <laughs> no more lines and, and so forth. So, um, so that's pretty much it. The Teacher Geek stickers are there. My cards are there. Um, again, my name is Darren Kuhn. You're welcome to email me. Um, I own the company. It's growing where we now are gathering more and more people. But I want to stay personal and intimate with you guys. If you have a problem, if you have a question, um, please do not hesitate to, to call us. Or if there's something that you have in particular, um, please give us a call and we'll, we'll try to help you out. Well, thank you very much.